Okay, I think that we should be able to start now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, this presentation. This is about my first work in the quantum thinker group, which is called the design of a Majorana trijunction. <clears throat> In this work, I have worked together with uh, Anton Akhmerov, my supervisor, and Satish, who was a PhD student at our group. Mm -hmm. And let's start. Oh, what happened? Sorry. Okay, perfect. So let us start by introducing the main character of our presentation today, which are Majorana bounds. In condensed matter system, systems, typically Majorana appear in superconductors. And a few things that we need to know about superconductors are that, first of all, its, expe it's spectrum typically looks like this. So you have a ground state with Cooper pairs. And that ground state is separated from the excited states by a gap that is typically called delta. If there are no impurities, impurities in the superconductor, there are no states inside of the gap. This is usually what we call a trivial superconductor. And in order to have Majoranas, we go to what is a so-called topological superconductor. The main difference is this red line that is now here exactly at zero energy. In a superconductor, what is above zero energy typically has an electron character and what is below typically has a hole character. Therefore, if, you're, if you are exactly at the middle between electrons and holes, you are an equal superposition of both. And you satisfy this equation here, which says that you are equal to your own antiparticle. And that is the, the idea behind a Majorana. However, let's look at them in more detail. What this line actually represents is a single fermionic state that in the left plot I code psi, and a single fermion can be empty or can be occupied, and therefore it can be zero or one. In a topological superconductor, Majoranas typically appear at the edge of the system, at the boundaries. And if the Majoranas are far away from each other, if there is no overlap between their wave functions, the states will be exactly at zero energy. And this is interesting because this shows the protection of the Majoranas, first of all, against local perturbations uh, in, happening in different sides of the wire, and also against perturbations that are smaller than delta. Any perturbation with an energy scale is smaller than this delta will not affect the Majoranas. So this is the reason why a single pair of Majoranas is interesting because it encodes a single fermion. However, if we have multiple pairs of Majoranas, it becomes more interesting. Now we have, for example, two pairs and that corresponds to two fermions. So now all the possible occupation states that we have are four and are depicted here on the left. These four states, all of them live at zero energy and now the degeneracy of this zero uh, of this state has increased. Now we talk about, about a degenerate ground state manifold where all these occupation states are protected by the symmetry and also by the scale of this gap. In order to break this protection, you need to couple different Majoranas. For example, if there is a perturbation that couples these two Majoranas that I depict here on the right, the state that they correspond will go away from zero energy. And therefore the number of zero energy states and the subspace that they represent will change. Now, instead of having four possible occupation states protected at zero energy, you will have only two. Something important to mention is also that these excited, that these new states at finite energy are either whole or electron and therefore they can couple to electrostatic perturbations, <clears throat> reducing their, off their protection. Majorana seem to be very interesting particles and they have been pursued experimentally. However, it is not that simple to make them experimentally as I just depicted because behind the phrase topological phase, there are actually multiple ingredients, all of which need to be fine-tuned and controlled to have these particles. They appear typically one in one-dimensional systems that can be, for example, long nanowires, which is here in the arsenide in green, 
and they need to be covered by a superconductor, in this case, aluminum. Besides that, they need to have multiple gates around it that control the chemical potential that are not depicted here. Nanowires are not the only platform, but there are also two-dimensional electron gases. <clears throat> In two-dimensional electron gases, you typically have a plane of electrons, electrons living in two dimensions. On top of this plane, you can deposit multiple gates that define how the potential is along the two deck. How is the potential that the electrons look at? And therefore you can confine them, for example, in one dimensional structures and then deposit superconductors, for example, aluminum. It is interesting because you are able to create complex shapes uh, in these potentials However, there has been no success in finding Majoranas so far. We're moving on this way. And there are another alternatives, for example, minimal key type chains that are trying to reproduce these topological Majoranas in minimal systems of a few quantum dots. And you can see two depictions of this in the right plots. Okay. Once we know a bit about experimental context, we can continue looking at Majoranas. And the question now is, if we know that perturbations that couple Majoranas affect them, how do we operate inside this protected subspace? And the question, and the answer to that question relies on the fact that Majoranas have non-abelian exchange statistics. What does this mean? It means that if you exchange the position of two Majoranas uh, in contrast to typical quantum particles that acquire a plus or a minus sign, they would transform to a different state. The operation of just swapping two Majoranas, moving them around, generates a unitary transformation in this degenerate subspace that changes the operations. This is especially interesting because changing the position of two particles, moving them around, is a discrete operation, which means that this rotation in this subspace, since it is discrete, it is protected. There are no errors when you swap the position of two Majoranas. In contrast, for example, to other qubit platforms where the uh, where the operations are continuous and therefore you can rotate a little bit more or a little bit less. In this case, it's discrete and therefore is protected, plus the quantum information stored in the Majorana themselves is protected. <clears throat> However, even though here it looks very simple, just changing from blue to yellow, we saw that Majorana devices are usually quite complicated and involve many moving parts. Therefore, Exchanging two particles in these devices does not seem like a trivial question. It seems like something rather complicated. We want to do it in a more realistic scenario. And we are not the first people to think about how to do braiding. In fact, there are multiple proposals about braiding. And some of these proposals rely on different ingredients. For example, there are proposals that rely on charging energy. There are proposals that are purely electrostatics. And there are proposals that combine these two uh, these two aspects. However, what all these proposals have in common is the fact that they are typically minimal models. That is, they are models that just consider the minimal ingredients necessary to show that this proposal works. And that, even though it demonstrates the working principle, does not tell much about what will happen in a real case. And in this context is where we can introduce our work. So what we do is that we consider a platform, a, no, we consider a proposal for braiding that already exists. In fact, we consider this proposal by, by Bernard van Heck in 2012, where he used, where he introduces the concept of a trijunction. Uh, I think it was introduced before. However, we take this proposal and we try to put it in a more realistic scenario, in a context where we can see how it would perform uh, in a more realistic device with more ingredients. So let's look at what is the minimal ingredient to realize this proposal. In this case, we want to exchange the position of two Majoranas. That is the point of braiding. We want to exchange gamma left and gamma right. However, we need an extra pair of Majoranas in order to temporarily move the quantum information of these Majoranas to a different place and being able to move them around, as we said. It's not that simple. Furthermore, we need control of the different couplings of the Majoranas in a trijunction. We need to be able to tune this, ga this capital gamma LT and the other gammas uh, very precisely uh, and 
it is not even clear if it's possible to control all these parameters. Typically in models, they are just swap as if they would be numbers, but in real experiments, these numbers arise from manipulating real gates, and it's not clear how they would perform. Um, however, let's proceed and let's look at the protocol in more detail. The protocol that we uh, that we consider for braiding considers three pairs of Majoranas. And if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that the number of, uh, of zero energy modes, the number of Majoranas determine the size of the computational subspace. And therefore, if we add a states or remove states from this soft space, we will break the computational space. So the first requirement that we need in order to do braiding is that the num that the degeneracy must be protected. That means that you always need to have the same number of zero energy modes. And in this case, it translates to the fact that at least two majoranas must be coupled at all times. Besides that, we need to couple majoranas within the same wire, which is done by Coulomb mediated couplings by at attaching a transmond qubit to this top wire. And we also need trijunction mediated couplings, which are these purple lines that are, uh, yeah, that couple majoranas in the trijunction. So let's look at the first step. So we want to move the positions of gamma left to gamma right. <clears throat> and the first step of the, of the braiding process is uh, turning on this coupling here, uh, this purple thick line. When we do this, we couple three majoranas. And since two majoranas are required to form a fermion, there will always be one decoupled majorana in this system. And that decoupled majorana delocalizes over the whole system and it's called gamma R. Gamma R delocalizes in these three majoranas coupled. This involves a long coupling. And then we look at the next step of the braiding protocol. First of all, we decouple the top wire. That means that this majorana that was delocalized over this whole system, over these this three majoranas, these three sites, will localize at the top because it's the only place where it can be decoupled. The next step that we do is that we turn on these two couplings simultaneously, such that this left majorana can delocalize in this region. And then we proceed with a, in a similar manner to decouple uh, one of the trijunction couplings, and then the left majorana will, and will localize on the right side because it's the only place where it's possible for it to couple. The last step of the braiding protocol is just to move back the majorana that we stored on the top to the left. And if you look at the first and the last steps, the positions of gamma L and gamma right have been exchanged. We take a look again at all the requirements and we can see that we satisfy the first one because all of at all points, at least two majoranas are coupled. At some points of the protocol, we use the Coulomb mediated couplings and also the trijunction mediated couplings. But in particular in this work, we do not focus on the Coulomb couplings because they have been studied previously in other works, but we rather focus on the electrostatic design of the trijunction, which pertains to these three steps here, three, four, and five. These are the steps in which our device would perform. Okay, so let us proceed to introduce how is the design and the simulation that we perform. The first ingredient that we have is the microscopic simulation of Majorana nanowires. We do not consider a minimal description, but we consider a microscopic model where we choose a really uh, a given material and we drive these wires into the topological phase by choosing the appropriate parameters. And there will be six Majoranas in total, as I mentioned. However, since we are focusing on the trijunction design and since the Majoranas are decoupled because the wires are long, we can consider only three Majoranas are of our subspace of interest. And we call them gamma left, gamma right, and gamma top. Now we proceed to the next part, which is an electrostatically defined trijunction potential. This is the center of our work. We focus on the middle region of this trijunction, and we choose that this trijunction is realized in a two-dimensional electron gas. We proceed to define how are the shapes of the gates that are on top of this two-dimensional electron gas in order to define a trijunction. So if you look at the plot on the right, there are different layers, but the purple layers are the ones that describe the gates. You have first a layer of depletion gates, 
that correspond to the shape in the left picture, where you can see that there are six gates and their potentials are controlled by voltages called B left, B right, and B top. On top of that, there is a global accumulation gate that is just like a, like a square and controls the overall chemical potential. We solve the Poisson equation for this three-dimensional system, and we find what is the potential exactly at the two-dimensional electron gas. And we see that it sort of, sort of has the shape of a trijunction uh, for some configuration of parameters. This line here that gives the scale corresponds to 200 nanometers. <clears throat> However, now that we have like the minimal trijunction sort of uh, functioning, we need to understand that it is not clear if this device will work beforehand. We actually don't know how it will work uh, and if it will couple them successfully, because for example, if, the, if this region is too small, all the Majoranas will be coupled at most times likely. So it will be very difficult to decouple them and it will not work. On the other hand, if the device is too large, it will be very difficult to induce a single coupling and it will likely not work. So we face this challenge of not knowing if this device will actually work, but we have four parameters that are these four, board, four voltages from the gates that we can use to find if it works. And the way in which we approach this problem is from an optimization perspective. We know that we want to control these couplings that we call gamma left top, gamma right top, and so on. And we want to make them as large as possible in order to induce the coupling between the Majoranas that we want, some of them. And we also want to make them as other, and we want to make other couplings as small as possible in order to keep to keep them decoupled, for example. <clears throat> so now we can couple Majoranas. In the case in the left, you see the case in which the middle region has been depleted. There are no states available in the middle region and therefore the Majoranas localize in their wires. And we have a nice picture of them. We can see, okay, this is the left, the right and the top. <clears throat> For a certain voltage configuration, on the other hand, the Majoranas couple. And you can see here that we have uh, the low energy space has like three states at minus energy, plus energy, and zero energy. And these states are some combination of Majoranas, of the decoupled Majoranas. However, if we just look at the single particle wave function, we cannot really tell how is this combination of Majoranas. If they have more of the top of the yellow or so on. Um, and in order to tell how coupled they are, we need to be able to decompose these Majoranas. We need to be able to express this new wave function as some sort of linear combination of decoupled Majoranas. And in this case, that is possible because these Majoranas, these decoupled states, form a particle hole symmetric basis. And any fermionic state can be decomposed into that fermionic base, into that Majorana basis. And the way in which we find out how decoupled they are, how coupled they are, is by using the overlap matrix. So in this pictorial representation, S is the overlap matrix, and we calculate the overlap, for example, between the yellow Majorana and this coupled eigenstate. We do so for all the, all the basis states, all the decoupled Majoranas, and then we proceed to do a unitary a singular value decomposition in, this, in the overlap matrix. Then we proceed to find what is the closest unitary transformation uh, that is just keeping the unitary part of the, overlap, of the overlap matrix, which is U times B dagger. And that would be the transformation that allows us to go from to the decoupled Majorana basis. So now we went from this coupled wave function that is called psi to the same wave function, but expressed in a basis where we can tell what are the individual Majoranas how much of each one is present in this wave function. And with that, we're able to do a transformation to the Hamiltonian, to the low energy Hamiltonian, and we're able to obtain an effective Hamiltonian that tells you how coupled are just these three degrees of freedom. And these gamma ij are the elements that we want to perform our optimization routine. So if we look back again at what is the, the procedure that we're following, 
Now we proceed to tune and operate the device based on these quantities that we take out of the effective Hamiltonian and describe just the three Majoranas that we care about. Okay, so that is nice. And now the next step in our research is to try to define an optimization problem based on the quantities that I just introduced, gammas. When we, the first uh, step that we care about is when we couple a single pair of Majoranas. That means that only two of them couple and the third one remains decoupled. A way to see that is to see that there is a quantity which we desire to maximize, which is the coupling of two Majoranas, which is gamma RT. There is also a quantity that we want to minimize, and that is the coupling to this remaining Majorana. So there is a desired coupling and an undesired coupling. And with these two quantities, we build a loss function, a, a cost function in this case, that has a minimum where the desired coupling is maximum and that tries to minimize the undesired coupling. Therefore, we proceed to minimize this quantity and we find the minimum and plot the result here. So this is the optimal point at which the right and the top Majoranas can be coupled. So if you look at panel D, the last of all of these panels, it shows how the potential in the trijunction region looks like. And we can see that one of the arms is easily coupled and the other two arms are sort of connected by a channel. <clears throat> if you look at the wave functions in panel C, you see that the wave functions perfectly connect these two Majoranas. Okay, so we see we have coupled them and the quantity to which through which we measure this is just the first excited state because it tells the first non-zero eigenvalue because it tells us the coupling. And we see that the optimal point that we found by minimizing this loss function is indicated by the purple line. And what we can see that it's on the maximum and that this is as good as we can couple this pair of Majoranas in, in this device. This is, okay, this is one of the ingredients that we need to do braving. And now we can proceed. We can proceed to the next ingredient, and that is that we need to couple simultaneously two pairs. As I show in this in this depiction, we need both of the per, two pairs to be coupled. And now the optimal point that we found before does not necessarily work, neither the same loss function. We needed to design a new, a new cost function. And the goal of this cost function is basically that we want to make equal the coupling of these two pairs while minimizing the coupling of the remaining pair. As before, we proceed with, a, with an optimization approach and we minimize this quantity using computational routines. And then we find the point that we need. So let's remain, let's remember ourselves the procedure that we want to simulate. And it's basically these three steps. One pair, two pairs, one pair. The important, another important consideration for this protocol that I introduced is that two Majoranas must be coupled at all times. And that means that when we change the voltages from this configuration to the next one, the gap must remain open. If the gap closes at any point in, uh, during this protocol, it will uh, the information encoded in the ground state will be lost essentially because we're changing the number of Majoranas. So it was a challenge to find what is what is the the loss function that allows you to find a path that is always open by a gap. Uh, however, with the cost function that I that I introduced before, we were able to find a point. Um, to which the gap is open at all uh, at all points in the voltage path. So what we do here is that we find the optimal points for these three situations shown in the top, one pair, two pairs, one pair, and then we just do a linear interpolation between these optimal points. This linear interpolation considers four voltages uh, simultaneously, and we see that it remains open. There is a point in which the gap the gap becomes small, however, it is uh, still not zero. And that means that this can be done adiabatically enough such that braiding is possible. And that is a central result of our work that at right junction supports braiding. It is actually possible to do braiding in an electrostatically defined right junction. 
However, it's not all. We need to know how good these projunctions are and under what conditions, uh, and what are the best projunctions or, uh, to say. And the requirements that we have in order to determine how good a projunction is, is first of all, that it needs to have a sufficiently large coupling. The superconducting gap that is usually present in these devices, in this one-dimensional change, it's smaller than the, than the gap of the parent superconductor. Here we denote it as delta T. This, in, uh, this topological gap is usually quite small. So we require, first of all, the, the desired coupling to be sufficiently large, uh, larger than this quantity. Similarly, we need the remaining majoranas to be decoupled because that will determine the speed at which this will need this device will be operated. So we that so we make the second constraint to our device. That is that delta plus should be at least 50 times delta minus. With these two constraints, we proceed to analyze different trajunctions. Uh, however, we also need to tune to take another factor into account, and that is the tunability of the trajunction. So what I do in this plot is that I show the coupling that is delta plus and the ratio delta plus over delta minus for different values of the of the voltage uh, of the depletion gates. The purple orange indicates the maximal point that we found using our optimization approach. And this red line indicates the region that is at least 85% uh, larger, uh, the maximum value in the sky. This red region, this region covered by this red line, it's the region where the coupling is sufficiently large. So it kind of represents the operational range of our device. That is, if we are in somewhere in this, uh, in this space, the coupling will be large enough, it will be sufficiently decoupled, and it's you know, operationally good. Mm, so we consider this region in red as the operational voltage, and then we proceed to classify different right junction geometries. The information that we get from each trijunction is represented in the following way. We will consider a panel that represents the coupling in gate voltage. The operational region will be shown in the sort of green uh, color map. And the color that this region has corresponds to the desired coupling. The background would correspond to the ratio of the desired over the undesired coupling. And this shape in the middle is the operational region. With this, we proceed to, to classify how good different trijunctions behave as a function of geometry. The geometrical parameters that we consider are the length of the channels, the width of the channels, and also the angle. Here, the panels that are transparent are those that are below this threshold. That means that the panels that are transparent are unsuitable for braiding. On the other hand, the panels that are highlighted or just look normal looking are the ones uh, are the geometries for which braiding is possible. <clears throat> um, we see first of all that small geometries perform better. Uh, they have a larger operational range and they also have a larger desired coupling uh, because the color of this region is just greener. And then we see that if we increase the length, if we make the channels longer, it is still possible to find a region where the trijunctions work. However, now there's an interplay between the length of the channel and the width of the channel. If it is too wide, then it's simply not possible to couple them and to decouple. And the same goes if they are too thin. So it is possible to find a working trijunction for a range of device geometries. Um, and this is a consideration regarding the shape. But this is done for a clean device. However, in reality, quantum devices are not clean. They, in general, have some sort of disorder, which could be, for example, shape disorder, which could be strain, or which could be just random charges that are trapped around. And for these materials in particular, this electrostatic disorder is quite relevant. So we proceed to evaluate how this trijunction performs if there are there is electrostatic disorder present. In this case, I show two plots where we have the optimal solution plus some random charges in the background. In the plot on the right, the concentration of charges is small. And in the plot of the left, it's large. You can see that for the right plot with low concentration, the 
potential of the trijunction survives. We can still see the channel and it's very likely that we, we will be able to couple the Majoranas. However, if there are too many charges around, unwanted charges that represent disorder, it is not even possible to define that channel. And that is detrimental for the Majoranas because basically we just lose all, all capabilities to tune this. Uh, we cannot control the electrostatic potential if the charges there already are too strong. So we consider the uh, disorder distribution as a parameter in our simulations, and we proceed to quantify the quantities of interest, the desired coupling, and the ratio. So to put some context, uh, 10 to the 12th is the density that is uh, likely the one that current materials have. 10 to the uh, 10 to the 10 is like a bleeding edge, bleeding edge material quality. It's very high material quality. And what this plot tells us is that if we have very clean materials, then it is possible to find a working right junction. However, if there is electrostatic disorder present, this disorder will be detrimental for the trijunction and ultimately it will not work. As you can see here, the desired coupling for these disorder concentrations is vanishing. Um, for intermediate disorders, it might be possible. However, this slide tells us that even though trijunctions are possible, they need materials that are very clean. And with this said, I proceed to summarize and conclude. Uh, first of all, we found that it is possible to braid Majoranas in an electrostatically defined trijunction. As we saw, the gap remains finite uh, along the path in voltage space where we perform braiding. Second of all, we conclude that it is possible to couple different pairs of Majoranas in a range of device geometries. There is an interplay between the different length scales and the geometry itself. However, for a range of geometries, it is possible. And the last conclusion that we have is that braiding requires bleeding edge material quality, which is very clean materials uh, are necessary for braiding. And with that said, uh, I thank you all very much for listening to the presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. May I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the um, the setup. So in the um, original Fang Heck paper, this yeah. braiding paper, they essentially assumed the three uh, myelinas in the center to be strongly coupled so that the two myelinas are sent to the higher energy and only the zero energy mode is left. And the braiding is performed by uh, controlling the Coulomb energy, which can be controlled by just changing EJ over EC. Right. What is wrong with this proposal? Oh, and there is we need to tune the coupling in the three middle uh, myronas. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the, with this proposal. In fact, I think that you like in the plot on the top right. You mean that uh, that just by controlling these five that are the magnetic fluxes, mm -hmm. you would be able to control this. Um, that is possible. However, I think that that proposal assumes that. Uh, that there are fixed values for the coupling between these different majoranas still. That assumes that these majoranas are strongly coupled. However, the point in which your research comes is that we don't know if it's possible to strongly couple them uh, selectively by pairs. Uh-huh, okay. I thought that just by making this trijunction part to be very small, the coupling can be large enough so that the uh, bonding and anti-bonding state can be projected away, and only the zero energy state remains. I think that's the uh, uh, yeah. essential assumption of the original proposal. In that case, this would be an alternative in which okay. can be performed via electrostatic control, uh, and the device doesn't need to be as small as possible, because as you mentioned, in that case, you just put the three ends of the wires really close to each other, but in this case, they can be hundreds of nanometers apart from each other. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Um, in the uh, in this trijunction area, the yeah. uh, Marna should not couple to the normal electrons or continuum of the semiconductor. Yeah. And to achieve it, usually we assume the uh, Andrew Fan states to be formed so that there is no low lying energies. But what is the assumption in your model? Um, so this normal part, this white shape part mm -hmm. is like a quantum dot, so that there are only discrete levels, or there um, are a lot of electrons and they form a continuum. That's a that's a transition that depends on the on the size of the of the junction. We do mm -hmm. make use of those levels because uh, our device is in the strong coupling case where there are levels inside here, and what we find is sort of that if you tune to the lowest level that can be inside of this channel, that is what will mediate the coupling. Because, one second. So this plot shows um, the, the coupling as a function of the gate voltages that decouple the channel. So these voltages sort of tune the different resonances that are available between these channels, inside of the channels. And you see that the first resonance where the coupling is very large coincides with the first level that appears inside of these channels. Um, depending on the size, I uh, don't know if you could call it an unread bound state per se, because the middle, the normal region is not proximitized. So these are normal states, they are not superconducting. Mm, but these levels do uh, are the reason why the the Majorana scope, the levels inside of the channels. And also, if you go to longer junctions, the level spacing will become smaller. And consequently, the operational voltage, the operational range will shrink because now the second resonance will come and that will uh, drop the coupling. So yeah, yeah you're right, basically. Hmm. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other question? I think that if there are no more questions, we can proceed to mm, close the talk. Um, thanks again to everybody for being for coming online.